Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat, and thank you, Sim, for inviting me and setting this up. And thanks to everybody for coming tonight and spending your evening um, hearing about my research. So um, I think I was asked to, to indicate if I had any connection to the Santa Cruz area. And I'm afraid that those connections are rather meager. I do have a cousin who lives down there, and I went to a camp in, the, in Felton in the hills of Santa Cruz called Mount Cross when I was in fourth and fifth grade. And that's about it. But um, very good memories of that camp. And I would love to come, come visit again to the Santa Cruz area. Um, so I am going to be showing images of replicas of human remains in this presentation, not actual human remains, but I am showing replicas and I wanna let you know that now so you can make an informed decision about your comfort level in viewing these slides. Um, so uh, as Pat said, I am a professor of anthropology at Sonoma State. Um, it is located and I am coming to you from the unceded land of the Southern Pomo and Coast Miwok people today recognized as the Federated Indians of Great and Rucheria. Um, so uh, we are located in Roanoke Park, north of San Francisco. We offer a number of degree programs, including the Master's in Cultural Resources Management, which is how I first met Pat um, when she was a student there, although I did not have the privilege of teaching her at that time. So um, my research is in the realm of bioarchaeology, and some of you may know what that is and others may not. So I'm going to give a um, just very brief overview. It is the contextual analysis of human remains from the past. And these can be from the more recent past, from usually at least a century ago, or the far distant past, you know, up to 40, 50,000 years ago. We're going to be looking at a period uh, from, you know, about 4,000 years ago. And the goal of this analysis is to reconstruct personal biographies uh, of individuals, but also histories of entire populations, past ways of life, past ways of death, um, drawing on many lines of evidence. So the human remains uh, or remains of skeletal ancestors, as we might also refer to them, but also ar archaeological evidence, uh, historical evidence, if it exists, um, iconographic or ethnographic evidence, everything we can use to really build as full of a picture as possible of, of life in the past. Um, so traditionally, bioarchaeologists have um, employed kind of macro scale, large scale uh, perspectives that look at populations as a whole. Um, especially in kind of starting in the 1970s and 80s, it was very important to them to look at as large of groups of uh, skeletal remains as possible so that they could uh, use statistical methods to detect patterns in those human remains that were statistically significant. Um, and they looked at some really interesting topics um, in terms of trying to uh, document major biocultural trends in human populations like interpersonal violence and imperialism, um, health and the origins of agriculture, identity and ethnogenesis. And some, some really important works are pictured here. Um, but in this approach, bioarchaeologists would only uh, usually distinguish into skeletons of individuals from the group as a whole if they were outliers of some sort, if they were you know, markedly different or if there was something kind of perceived to be wrong with them. Um, more recently, uh, an approach that's gaining traction is called osteobiography. And this entails um, a more micro scale focus on uh, individuals. And so uh, this is trying to record the life history in bone or reconstruct that life history, again, of individuals. And the most recent version of this method builds on third wave feminist um, theory, which encourages us to try and reconstruct ancient experiences as the um, esteemed professor uh, uh, emerita at UC Berkeley, Ruth Tringham said, the genderless faceless blobs who people so many traditional interpretations of the past. Um, these theories also remind us that uh, archaeological theories of long-term and large-scale processes are based on material evidence that results from everyday life. So um, some of the works that we've seen that reflect this approach are pictured here, like the Smithsonian Institution's exhibit um, on that presented osteobiographies of colonial Euro-Americans and uh, the more recent Bioarchaeology of Individuals book. 
So I take this approach in my research to osteobiography, and I apply to it a perspective that's kind of encapsulated here by the author, Isabel Allende. Um, and I'll let you read this for yourself. But she uh, included this excerpt um, when she was receiving her uh, National Book Awards Lifetime Achievement Award uh, that speaks to the power of stories and how stories can um, highlight the similarities that bring people together more than differences that separate us. And so that is the kind of ethos that has inspired much of my work here. So the approach that I take to osteobiography um, is one that I call fictive osteobiographical narratives. Um, and this basically means that I tell stories about the skeletons that I study. Um, these are stories that are situated in the times and places where these now skeletonized people once lived. Stories that incorporate evidence of identity and of experience that's left behind on their remains. Um, and so again, I call them fictive osteobiographical narratives, which, which makes them sound very important, but it's kind of a fancy way of saying stories. But let me explain what's behind this term. So this word osteobiography, osteobiographical, um, I mentioned that this was a term, it actually came about in the late, uh, in the 1970s from uh, Frank Saul, who worked mostly in the Mayan world. And he was the one who argued that um, bioarchaeological approaches to the life histories of individuals could enhance exploration of health, behavior, and social customs at the population level. And as I mentioned, this approach is um, continuing to grow in popularity. The word narrative, um, I refer to these as narratives because they're told in a story-like affective fashion. And I'll come back to this term affective in a little bit, as opposed to more traditional analytical academic interpretations. And they're written in more accessible language. So one of the pioneers of writing archeological narratives is my retired colleague at Sonoma State, Adrian Pretzelis, who's pictured here. And finally, fictive. This is a term that I borrowed from UC Berkeley professor, Lori Wilkie, who's a historical archeologist who experiments with um, alternative forms of writing. So this term fictive, it's kind of a, a play on fictional, but it foregrounds the contingency and the constructedness of the interpretations that we as archeologists and bioarchaeologists are always engaging in, but that we don't always acknowledge, right? That we are kind of fitting together these pieces, these clues from the past in a way that makes sense to us and maybe incorporate some of our own assumptions, trying to make more transparent that process of knowledge production. Um, so the idea is that writing these fictive osteobiographical narratives can push bioarchaeologists to draw on as many lines of evidence as possible to understand how their research subjects identities, which were likely intersectional, they uh, incorporated many different facets that intersected with one another um, and were embodied. And that's what we can see from the skeleton. And really rich holistic interpretations can result, I found. So this is part of a larger framework that I've called the bioarchaeology of personhood. And part of the reason that I argue for these types of narratives is because I think they're, I think they're more interesting and they're more accessible to the general public. But more recently, I'd started to wonder um, whether those benefits could go beyond simply being interesting to the public to actually making a difference in society. And this was based on my engagement with research by social psychologists. But I'm not a social psychologist, so I had to add another author to the story, who was my friend, uh, Matthew Pellucci Callahan. He is also a professor at Sonoma State, and he's the ideal research partner because he is a social psychologist. He studies empathy and prejudice. He's much better at statistics than I am, and he has great taste in wine. So perfect research partner. So I'll be talking to you to, uh, this evening about this interdisciplinary research project that we've been working on, which is uh, the goal of which is to explore um, how affective interpretations of bioarchaeological data, like these fictive osteobiographical narratives, uh, the extent to which they can increase modern people's empathy uh, toward and reduce their prejudice against people who are different from themselves. So we're gonna go into some of these social psychology theories, and then I'm going to show um, how we conducted this experiment with this um, old man from Dillman as our case study.
So um, we're going to begin with this research by social psychologist Seymour Epstein. Uh, according to his global theory of personality, narrative representations belong to an experiential style of processing information and making decisions. So this experiential style has an affective basis. Um, it's predicated on things like intuition, experience, and emotional response. While the rational style has an analytical basis, and it's grounded in logic, rational analysis, justification through evidence. And it actually turns out that the experiential style is more effective at solving problems. It can result in better judgments, and it can operate at higher levels of complexity than the analytical system. And Epstein argues that narrative styles of writing in particular have intrinsic appeal because of the way that they can be emotionally engaging and represent events uh, in a way that's similar to how they're actually experienced in real life. So it's not a great surprise that social psychologists have found that literary fiction, specifically the Harry Potter series, can improve attitudes and reduce prejudice towards stigmatized groups and increase empathy for them. Um, so it does seem like the narrative approach to interpreting bioarchaeological data would find support from social psychology as a way of enhancing empathy for and reducing prejudice toward people from the past. We also can find some evidence in support of osteobiographical methods from social psychology. Paul Slovic describes how affective responses, uh, both positive and negative, are translated into more nuanced feelings like empathy, sympathy, and compassion all of which can motivate people to help others. So his research demonstrates that affective responses are maximized by images, which can include biographical sketches and photographs, images of identified individuals, whereas affective res responses are numbed in response to groups of unidentified or statistical individuals. So if you're familiar with the journalist Nicholas Kristof, who wrote for the New York Times for a long time, he was, is, um, was influenced by Slovak's work. And that's why in a lot of his writing, he focuses on one individual at a time as a way to connect with uh, his audiences. So taking together these two bodies of social psychology research seem to strongly support the empathy generating potential of interpretations of, interpretations of bioarchaeological data that are both osteobiographical in scope and narrative in style. But Matthew and I wanted to find out if these fictive osteobiographical narratives actually can generate empathy and reduce prejudice. So Matthew introduced me to a large body of research that shows when people feel empathy for a person. So here empathy, we're talking about experiencing feelings of warmth, of sympathy, of compassion. Um, so if they feel this way toward a person from an underrepresented or disparaged group, their prejudice is reduced not only toward that one person, but toward the entire group as well, even if their stereotypes about that group remain intact. So this effect has been demonstrated for a variety of groups, including African-Americans, Arabs and Muslims, drug addicts, and um, other groups. And so Matthew and I were very interested in the fact that Americans tend to hold a negative attitude toward Arabs and Muslims, the groups that are frequently and to some extent erroneously conflated with the Middle East. And numerous studies have documented especially strong feelings of prejudice toward and consequently discrimination against Muslims and Arabs, as well as stereotypes held toward these groups. But more recent research by psychologist Dan Johnson has shown that literary fiction can increase empathy and reduce prejudice toward Arabs and Muslims. So Matthew and I decided to assess the extent to which this effects holds true when the subject of these fictional, fictional narratives not only derives from the Middle East, but lived thousands of years earlier than the people uh, who are participating in the research. So to run a study, we needed an osteobiographical subject. And for that, we turned to my research on the Dillman Bioarchaeology Project, which was founded in 2009 by me and Dr. Benjamin Porter of the Department of Near Eastern Studies at UC Berkeley. And the goal of this project is to analyze and publish a mortuary assemblage from uh, the early Dillman Society, uh, which existed from the third through first millennia BCE in the Arabian Gulf. And so you can see pictures of Dr. Porter on the bottom left. Above that, he is studying one of the um, uh, objects that was placed in one of the graves 
On the upper right is one of my former students from Sonoma State who was studying some animal bones that were placed in the graves. Um, below, I'll, I'll show you that picture actually on the next slide and explain it, but here you can see the location that we're talking about in the world. So this is in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, this is the Arabian or Persian Gulf. It's called differently depending on which side you're on. And the island of Bahrain that we're really going to be focusing on here. So these uh, skeletal remains and associated artifacts were excavated from burial mounds on the island of Bahrain by a man named Peter B. Cornwall in 1940 and 1941. So he focused on the island of Bahrain. He also surveyed a number of archaeological sites on the east coast of Saudi Arabia. Um, he then donated everything he had excavated to the Phoebe A. Hearst Museum of Anthropology at UC Berkeley in the early 1950s where they were curated um, for many decades, but really were not studied much until Dr. Porter and I started this project. So just a little bit about Dilmun. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the kind of its existence as a political entity was from the late third through first, uh, mid first millennium B. Um, it is, its name is known from Sumerian mythology. So one of the creation myths of the Sumerians was of the gods uh, Enki and Ninma creating humans. And they supposedly lived uh, in Dilmun, which was described as having very paradise-like qualities. So there have been attempts to um, frame Dilmun as sort of the original garden of Eden. Um, in fact, once I was actually asked to go on the show Ancient Aliens to explain that, uh, that whether or not Dilmun actually was the Garden of Eden and therefore whether it was located in Bahrain and I declined that invitation. Um, so Dilmun is known from Sumerian mythology. It is also um, another reason it's known from Mesopotamian texts um, was because of its location on major trading routes between uh, the Indus state of what's now Pakistan and India. Um, uh, it was kind of a middleman between them and Mesopotamia. And some of the goods that Dilmun exported were things like dates, pearls, and textiles. Um, so just some representations of the types of objects we have from ancient Dilmun um, and uh, types of goods they produced. Um, so one thing that is significant here is that Peter B. Cornwall's research did successfully convince his peers that Dilmun had been sent In Saudi Arabia up to uh, Kuwait. So um, from this assemblage, the person whose remains we decided to focus on as this osteobiographical case study was uh, given the museum uh, catalog number by the Hearst 12-101-52. And uh, analysis of his skeleton revealed that this was a male who was at least 70 years old uh, when he died. Um, and based on the objects that were found with him and other notes, it seems that he lived during the early Dilmun period to the end of the third millennium uh, to the beginning of the second millennium BCE, sometime in that time frame. Um, he'd been laid to rest in one of the many burial mounds that dotted the landscape and that still do dot the landscape in parts of the island. Um, in this case, the Um Jitter Mound Cemetery along the islands uh, or near the island's western coast, as indicated by the red arrow. Um, and his skeleton revealed a long lifetime of intensive physical activity, especially in his upper body. Lots of um, en enlarged and roughened muscle markers on the bones of his arms, um, osteoarthritis through pretty much all of his major joints, but very strong on the right shoulder, which I'll be returning to later, um, and on the, the left knee as well. And um, in his jaw, he'd lost all the teeth of his mandible, and most of those in his maxilla just had a few of the anterior teeth remaining. So this will come back um, when we talk about the facial reconstruction later. So um, in order to carry out this research, we created a, a questionnaire that we wanted to uh, have people fill out using Qualtrics software. Um, and then we recruited participants online through an Amazon program called Mechanical Turk, which I had never heard of, but it's this thing where you can go on Amazon and you get paid to do research studies. You may only get a little bit, we only paid 60 cents for each person to do ours, but it's a way to get people to participate and you get a variety of people participating. It's not like you go to a college campus and you only get 18 to 21 year olds. You get a broader range, although you can tailor it to what you want. 
we did say that participants in our study had to be at least 18 years old and live in the United States. So um, we did have the study approved by our institution's institutional research board for research with human subjects. And so uh, participants, uh, after they would give their informed consent, would read a, a description about Dilmun and its extent in the Middle East. So particularly that it maps on to present day Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Bahrain, and Qatar, actually. They were shown this map, and then they were asked to read an osteobiography about the skeleton of the elderly, oops, Dilmunite man, um, paying close attention to the details provided. But they were then randomly assigned to read one of three versions of the osteobiography. Um, and I'll go over these examples in just a sec, the analytical, technical, analytical colloquial, or affective analytical narrative. And we made sure that all three of these were um, uh, presented the same data, were about the same length, but they varied in the style and the language used in their writing. So I'll show you these examples now. Um, so the analytical technical osteobiography was written in this analytical style of information processing and decision making. If you recall, Epstein had said this was based on logic and rational analysis and evidence. So the language is quite technical, it's quite specialized, and it's really aimed at professionals in the disciplines of archaeology, bioarchaeology, or human skeletal anatomy. So this is the language and style that are frequently used in academia, but can easily be construed by other profession, by people other than professionals or academics as jargon. Um, so you can see the way that uh, in the sample text I explained the condition of his shoulder, that osteoarthritis, that there were these um, small bony uh, outgrowths on the edges of the joint surface of the humeral head, um, but other changes that suggested the shoulder joint remained in use. Um, for the next version, we still maintained an analytical style, but we used more colloquial language. So everyday language that is intended to be more easily comprehensible to the general public. Something like you might read on an interpretive panel at a museum. And it avoids the use of specialized language as much as possible. So you can see here, it's talking about the osteoarthritis more severe on the right side as compared to the left. The bone surface was polished, which tells us that he was still using the joint. Then the affect of analytical narrative osteobiography was written for both styles of information processing. And remember, affective is based on intuition and emotional response. So here we're writing the uh, story in an affective story-like style, excuse me, the narrative in a story-like style, where we're taking the available data and weaving it together according to um, essentially my imagination, but grounded in the evidence from the human remains and everything found with them. Um, and then, uh, so that's what's in italics here. And then the evidence for the inferences I'm making is provided in the uh, footnote, which is itself written in analytical style. So in and, and both cases, the, the language is colloquial. It's intended to be comprehensible to the general public. Um, but also uh, not only to them, but to professionals and disciplines other than bioarchaeology. So uh, the participants read one of these, then they answered questions. And so to measure their empathy, we asked them to describe the extent to which they felt each of the following adjectives toward the man whose remains were described in the osteobiography on a scale of one, not at all, to seven, extremely. You can see all those adjectives here. We average those responses uh, to create an overall mean index of empathy. Then we measured prejudice with a feeling thermometer, which asks them to indicate how warm or favorable versus cold or unfavorable they felt about the region where the remains of the elderly man were found. And we, we specified they were found in Bahrain, off the coast of present day Saudi Arabia in the Middle East. So we're very specific about that region of the world and what it's called today. And then lastly, the participants completed a, a series of demographic questions and we explained what the purpose of the goal of the project was. We had a total of 243 participants. So this is where Matthew uh, really took over with the statistical analysis, which I will attempt to relay the results of. Um, so first we compared the empathy means for the three versions. So this was our first hypothesis about empathy. We hypothesized that the narrative would elicit more empathy than the analytical colloquial version 
which would itself elicit more empathy than the analytical technical version. Um, and the analysis showed that the version of the osteobiography did affect uh, empathy scores. There was significantly higher empathy actually in both the colloquial and the narrative versions compared to the analytical technical version. And that was statistically significant um, at the level of uh, uh, less than 0 0.01. Um, but interestingly, contrary to our predictions, the narrative and colloquial did not differ from one another. They were both equally effective generating empathy. We next turn to the hypothesis um, that the narrative osteobiography would lead to differences in prejudice toward people in Bahrain and by extension in the Middle East. And uh, there were a range of feelings thermometer scores that eventually re revealed that people who read the narrative were higher in warmth, thereby lower in prejudice uh, versus both the colloquial and the technical versions with different levels of significance as shown at the bottom, uh, point P uh, less than 0 0.05 for the uh, technical and 0 0.01 for colloquial. Um, again, kind of contrary to our predictions, the technical and colloquial didn't differ from one another in the feelings thermometer rating. So they were the same in terms of reducing prejudice. So what this tells us is that the colloquial and narrative osteobiographies were equally good at generating empathy and both performed a lot better than the technical in this regard. Um, and both of those were written in predominantly colloquial language, which really validates its use in, when you're trying to communicate with members of the general public. By contrast, it seems like technical specialized uh, language creates an emotional distance between readers, both professional and public readers, uh, and the past subjects whose remains are being interpreted. The osteobiography, the narrative osteobiography was the only version that was significantly more effective at reducing prejudicial feelings toward people from Bahrain compared to the other versions of osteobiography. So for the next version, uh, phase of our project, excuse me, we wanted to look at affective visual imagery that bioarchaeologists might use like facial reconstructions, scientific illustrations of past people and life ways and field photographs. Um, so we ultimately decided to focus on the facial reconstructions. So many scholars have written, sometimes almost in passing, about how they're a useful mode of interpretation and outreach because they can connect emotionally with viewers. Um, here's a quote from a fairly recent publication saying that historical figures, uh, facial reconstructions can create empathy. But no one had actually tested this. It was more of an assumption, it was anecdotal. Um, so we decided to actually assess how facial reconstructions fare at elicit, eliciting empathy and reducing prejudice compared to other forms of visual imagery, as well as the written osteobiographies. So our procedures for phase two were pretty much identical to phase one, with a couple exceptions. Um, we took out the, the technical and analytical technical condition. We wanted to focus on exploring potential differences between the colloquial and narrative versions of the osteobiography. And again, we added the variable of facial reconstructions, but we directly manipulate that. So here's what I mean by that. In phase one, all participants had seen an image of the old man's skull, and this is a cast of his skull of replica. Um, they'd seen this image as they read the osteobiography, but here we randomly assigned participants to view one of two images. They either looked at the skull or they looked at the facial reconstruction after reading the osteobiography. And here we ended up with a final sample of 362 participants. Um, so here, because of time constraints, I'm just gonna focus on the results from the two types of images. So first, our analysis of the empathy scores does reveal an effect between the two images of uh, 0 0.01. This is a, a small difference, but it's, it is significant, suggesting that the image of the facial reconstruction did elicit more empathy from viewers than did the image of the skull. Looking at the facial, uh, sorry, the feelings thermometer scores, again, we found another small but significant effect. So people felt warmer toward residents of the Middle East when they looked at the image of the facial reconstruction versus that of the skull. So across both of the analyses in phase two, the image of the facial reconstruction had significant effects, eliciting more empathy and causing less prejudice, overall producing better attitudes toward the Middle East. 
And then finally, we conducted an exploratory analysis to see whether empathy toward the elderly man was associated with prejudice toward modern people in the Middle East. And it turned out there was a strong correlation. We observed in both phases one and two of our study. So these findings are consistent with other social psychology research, which uh, suggests that when you cultivate empathy for one person from a stigmatized group, attitudes toward the entire group improve. In other words, empathy is an antidote to prejudice. What's really interesting and unprecedented from a social psychology perspective and for us as bioarchaeologists is that our study has documented feelings of empathy toward a person who's no longer alive, yet attitudes toward the living population from which he derived still improved by looking at the spatial reconstruction. And our findings are uh, also important in light of Americans generally negative um, perceptions of Arabs and Muslims. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, that tends to be typical in the United States and has been associated with support for aggressively discriminatory policies. So we're trying, uh, oh, and I should say, sorry, uh, there's a picture uh, on the bottom left is a modern people of Bahrain. Um, and the bottom right is the facial reconstruction of the old man. So while you can't see things, you can only see his face, you can't see the arthritic shoulders or anything like that. But his face, uh, we did work with a forensic artist who really worked to um, capture his wrinkles, his possible um, you know, facial hair and, and form of dress, but also to capture his uh, anti-mortem tooth loss. So it's kind of a sunken in face and it's hard to see from this, but it's a little asymmetrical. He had um, uh, atrophy on one side of his uh, mandible, probably from disuse and some osteoarthritis of the mandibular condyle as well. So that's what it went into the facial reconstruction. So we are trying to share our findings widely with academic and professional uh, public audiences. We did publish the results of phase one of our research in uh, an academic journal, Bioarchaeology International. And we recommend to bioarchaeologists to experiment with writing that employs colloquial language uh, or narrative writing styles and work with uh, forensic artists, scientific artists to produce these facial reconstructions because the results can be positive and potentially more impactful than they could have otherwise imagined. So we're hoping to publish the results of phase two in venues related to public interpretation and museum studies, recommending to them affective forms of interpretation when emphasizing uh, uh, human remains uh, for purposes of public outreach. We think it'll help visitors uh, connect emotionally with people from the past, which will then again in turn improve their attitudes toward the modern populations from uh, which these people came. So in other words, we're arguing that telling stories about and showing reconstructed images of people from the past can help visitors, uh, readers, other members of the public better connect with people who are different from them in the present. And that's what we need more of today. So thank you. And uh, here's my email address if you have questions that we don't have time to answer today and a link to my um, academia.edu page if you wanna download publications related to this or other things.